and welcome to That Eurovision Podcast, Eurovision with a Slice of Life. My name is Helen, and I am in the hosting seat for the first time, so anything that goes wrong, blame me. Um, <laughs> I'm doing okay. My parents are in England. Uh, they have been for the past 15 days-ish or so, and I haven't seen them in over a year and a half, so it's been really nice to hang out with them and show them around Leeds and everything and them making so many more friends in two weeks than I have in the past year. So yeah, it's been fun having them around and uh, yeah, but they have kindly afforded me time to come and do this today. So joining me today are... Hi, it's Rosie and I am currently surrounded by a very playful and excited kitten. Uh, so if you hear any rustling in the background, I apologize. That's not something really within my control. And she's just really chirpy and happy and it's, it's really nice. And yeah, interested to talk about today's country. I got to delve into some archives and listen to some entries that I hadn't ever done previously. and. Yeah, it was, it's very, very interesting. So looking forward to discussing today's episode. And uh, I'm Lewis. Um, I'm also here with a just the best kitten in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also really excited um, to, talk, to talk about the country today. Having listened to, uh, to their past entries, I, I I think they fill a really interesting spot uh, within Eurovision, so I'd be interested be interested to talk about that. Um, Tim here. Uh, another um, exciting weekend. Not much has happened other than the fact that um, got a new phone and that took ages to set up. But other than that, I'm very very excited about this year. Just be uh, this um, country, just because of the fact that. I've stand them so hard for the past few years and this year didn't really go any well. If you're Filipino and you're listening to this, then you already know what's going to happen. So I'm going to let Helen take it away. So as everyone has alluded to, we are all very excited because today we are going to be talking about Austria. And I have also been standing Austria pretty much since 2014. And we'll talk about that icon in a sec. But um, yeah, for me, they've just been kind of one of the most consistent in terms of quality, or at least songs that scream me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, a little bit of background on Austria in the contest. They first participated in 1957. They came in in year two. Um, they have 53 participations out of 65. They have two wins, one in 1950. Sorry, one in 1966 with Udo Jorgens and Merci Sherry. And of course, our icon, 2014 Eurovision winner, Conchita Verst with Rise Like a Phoenix, the greatest Bond song that is not a Bond song. And they have been absent a few times, but unlike Italy, where it was a very long stretch of not being there, they've been in and out. They did not participate in 1969 or 1970 for reasons 1973 1975 they were also absent and then they were kind of in and out in the in the early 2000s and they had a bit of a spotty record they have seven last place finishes in the 20th century but since 2014 they have really brought it they maintained a qualification streak until 2019 when unfortunately they did not qualify And once again, in 2021, they were absent from the final. So to get started, what are everyone's favorite standout entries from Austria? So for me, um, going to their more recent entries first from the era where I've been watching, it has to be Rise Like a Phoenix. It's something that is so beautiful and so powerful and... The song itself is fantastic, but all of the things that surround it and everything about who Conchita Verst slash Tom Neurath as a person, everything they stand for is amazing. And it just 
adds so much more power to an already very, very powerful performance. Um, as well as that, I also want to give a shout out to their host entry, which was massively underrated. Um, Make Makes, I Am Yours, absolutely was not a zero pointer, really enjoyed it. I sort of lost, lost a bit of love for it for a few years and then rediscovered it um, fairly recently and have really enjoyed listening to it again. And also um, Zoe with Luan DC. I have a pretty strong tolerance for sickly songs in Eurovision and um, this is pretty sickly, but I love it. I think it's so charming. I think it's so sweet and it fills me with joy. Going back to some of the entries that I discovered when I was looking through their back catalogue, there were a few years that stood out to me. Um, the first one was their 1971 entry, um, Music by Marianne Mend. Um, really upbeat, really joyful, and it felt very different to a lot of what they'd been sending before. A lot of what they'd been sending was very classical ballad type music. And I think this was really where you could start to see the contest change, um, both in terms of Austria's entries and in terms of the contest as a whole. And also their 1982 entry, Sontag by Mess. Um, when I watched it, this is possibly not the most complimentary of comparisons, but I make it in a complimentary way. It reminded me of Same Difference from the UK X Factor. It felt like it had kind of stepped straight out of High School Musical. And I mean that in the most complimentary way. It's a really fun rock and roll, proper, um, again, joyful, upbeat, happy sort of number. And I'm really glad that I got to discover it looking for songs for this podcast. For me, again, it has to be Rise Like a Phoenix. I think I could talk around it, but we have had some great, some great winners this decade, but Rise Like a Phoenix still stands as one as absolutely one of the best without question. It's it's a good song in and of itself. The performance is good in and of itself. What can she the worst represent is good in and of itself. All of that coming together is just such a powerful moment, and I completely see why it won. Um, for other picks, I'd have to uh, I'd have to go for nobody but you. I think it was a very worthy third place in in 2018. I think Cesar Sampson has such an amazing voice, and that sort of, and that sort of style. The it's very it, it's very similar to Austria's more typical uh, ballady style, but it's it's carrying over some of the strength from Kinchi's verse, and I think it's uh, I think it's a really good area for them uh, for them to explore, and it's just something that really works for me. And also, it's it it's perhaps not their highest quality entry, but I also really like Get a Life, Get a Life from two thousand seven. I mean, I'm more I'm, I'm more of a fan of sort of Eurovision rock than Eurovision ballads anyway. But I feel like it's a it, it's a bit of an experiment for uh, for Austria, which I like, and I just think the energy the the energy behind it is. It's there. It's such a fun, encompassing song, and it might and it might not be as skilled as as some of their other entries, but I I think it's just fun. Ooh, okay. Ooh, okay. Um, I'm gonna start the songs, but um, the first one, as you already know, the why I love Austria is Vincent Bueno. <laughs> so shout out to Vincent. Uh, he's very lovely, and the fact that. He went with two different styles. Obviously, he went with Amen this in 2021 as we're recording this. And Alive, which I really loved because of the fact that this the style of the song suits him and it's the way that he performs. So props to him. Another one would be, I'd say Nathan Trenton running on air. Because like I remembered when this was first released, everyone was just like already downplaying their chance his chance on the contest and then suddenly he was the last one to be called to qualify for the final which you know I love for him and he deserved that so 
yay for him. Uh, and of course, who could we can't talk about Austria without talking about Conchita? Come on, like change the contest for the good. You know, it sent out a good message, and the way they just performed, like the reprise on the final, they would just cry. I was like, mm. all of Europe was crying with you. <laughs> Um, looking at the older entries, um, I'm probably going to get some slack for this, but 2003, Alf Poye, Wilder Menzot. I don't think I pronounced that correctly, but damn, like, I like some, like, I, I, I think it's an entry that might be perceived as a joke entry, <laughs> but you know what? It's fun. And you know, props to uh, for like placing six for performing second because that rarely happens. So I'm guessing he, he must have done something well for th- for that to happen. And you know what? I'm just I'm just guessing Europe was just vibing with him on the night. <laughs> and one final thing, um, also pay respects to the first winner of the uh, Eurovision Song Contest for Austria, Udo Jürgens with Mercy Sheree. It's just a timeless classic. Like if you want like something calm, like you need to feel elegant on a night out. Just like, you know, posh dinner, yada, yada, yada. Mercy Sherry. And props to him because he, bu- he, he bought it home, the first one, and it worked well. I'll just have to echo everybody here. Um, we can't not talk about Conchita. I, the, the song contest actually just put out um, her performance again on their YouTube channel and I watched it and I just that very um, long zoom from the back of the the auditorium all the way up to a close-up on her and pulling back it was just like they knew exactly what they were doing it's class it's queer as hell which we love Um, I just 2014 was the first contest that I ever watched in whole or in part and I watched it because people were like posting pictures of Conchita on my timeline. And I was like, what is this? I need to find out what this is. And I was so happy that she won. And then the next year, of course, the make makes did not deserve zero points overall. (laughs) Um, But I just have to shout out Austria again for hosting in 2015 because they did such a good job. I still rewatch the beginning of that um show the, the first 20 minutes or so with the building bridges and you know kids choirs always just make me cry I don't really have any say over that that just happens um <laughs> but I don't know Austria every year for some reason their entry comes out and they've done so many different genres over the last five or six years and yet every single one of them gets to me um I'm probably in the minority on this, but I really liked uh, Panda's Limits in 2019. I thought it was just a beautiful staging, very subdued and goes with the song so well. And it's so personal to her. I think Alive in 2020, I do prefer Alive to Amen, I'm not gonna lie. And I do think that if 2020 had gone ahead, Alive would have probably qualified and done very, very well. It's my husband's favorite 2020 song and it's for sure in like my top 10. But yeah, really kind of sad that that didn't get a chance to shine because I really liked, I mean, what we saw of the music video and whatnot. And I just tell he had so much charisma and he would have totally brought that in a performance. Um, Nathan Trent as well did not deserve zero telephone points. I felt so bad for him. I really liked just his very positive energy on stage and who doesn't love the DreamWorks kid. But yeah, I mean, 2017 was the first time I watched the semis and I was really kind of trying to suss out in real time, like who I wanted to go through. And I think he was like fourth or fifth in the, on the night. And I was just like, you know, I'd like to see that again. And it went through, but yeah, whether they've qualified or not, Austria for me has just been one of the countries that I look forward to seeing what they've chosen the most each year. All right. Oh, and of course, we do have to, again, mention uh, Udo, Udo Jorgen's uh, Merci Cherie. Just 
a classic and it is very sad that we lost him so close uh, to the beginning of the 2015 contest because we know he really wanted to to make an appearance and celebrate for his country and I really liked the little tribute that they gave to him at the beginning of of the grand final it was very sweet all right so we've mentioned it they Austria had a string of qualifications and I might as well just say they sent a lot of bangers between 2014 and 2018 but they do now have a non-qualification streak. So what would you say Austria has done well in Eurovision and what might they be able to do to improve their chances of getting back to the final? For me, when I was going through Austria's entries, the main word that really stuck out for me was safe. And more recently, they have started to take a few more risks. Some worked out very well, 2014 being one example. Some did not work out very well, 2012 being one example. But I feel like for me, there's nothing that really sort of stands out. Um, I feel like for me, everything is very conventional. Everything is very often quite with the times and things like that. Some of it you could even say is probably quite timeless. But I feel like it's the sort of music that you look back on and go, oh, that was really good, rather than appreciating it in the moment. I feel like it lasts well, but at the same time, it doesn't stand out in a contest. So I feel like for me, the way of getting them back into the final would be to send something that is a bit riskier, that is a bit different, something that is possibly more genre-like some rock, some opera, some folk, something that would really stand out amongst a field because it's competing in a field of around about 40 songs. Even in a semi-final, you've still got to stand out amongst um, 17, 18 songs most years. And I feel like that's one of the things they've struggled to do. They send fantastic vocalists with very competent, very well-made songs but that's not enough to get you through anymore. And I feel like they need to realize that they've got to stand out. And in a way that doesn't necessarily compromise the music that they're sending, but also not going for the safe option every single time. Following on from that, I would say, I agree with, with what Rosie said about Austria, but I don't necessarily agree about what the, about how to fix it. I think, first off, I have to say, I am not the biggest fan of, of, of Austria. I respect the hell out of them. I think every year they always bring something, with 2012 being a notable exception, <laughs> they always bring something high quality and classy and with an incredible performer, sung well. But as Rosie was saying, um, she used the word safe. I would almost describe it as, it sounds really insulting, but easy listening. It feels, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't feel challenging. And I, I, I said before, I'm much more of a fan of Eurovision rock than Eurovision ballads. And Austria, historically at least, has been much firmer in the ballads camp. So that my biases are definitely coming into play there. But Generally, I would just say that Austria that that Austria always always does change with the time. Like Limits, for example, that is a song that could not be made in any time before the late the late 2010s. It's so incredibly modern and of the moment, but it's also compared to the stuff on the radio, it's a safer, more toned down version of that to me. And I think looking back at their older entries, you can see you you can see that pattern throughout the years. You can see songs that are definitely cutting it ed cutting edge for the year for, for the year they were released in, but are still safer. But I would say even if it, it even if that style isn't something that works for me, I respect that. I, I respect it. I, I think it's got a real place in Eurovision. I think that. You can rely on Austria to bring quality. You can rely on Austria to bring class and power and just singing talent. And 
I don't think changing genres would necessarily be be moving away from that, but I'm not sure it'd help. I think st- I, I think sticking the course with these power with with these powerful single led uh, more ballads than not. I think that I I think that's the way to do it. I just think you need sing that you, you you need singers with charisma who are allowed to properly who are allowed to make to to make a song that represents them. I think that that's what Conchita did so so well. I think that's what's I think I'm not even sure if that's what Caesar Sampson did, but it certainly felt like it. And I think that's uh, that's how Austria can um, can win. And it has only been two year, uh, two years non qualification. I don't think um, it, it. It's not like Latvia. I don't think it's a uh, it's a streak quite yet. I have to echo with what Rosie's saying. It's a bit too safe. And I actually, I was actually, while the guys were talking, I was actually delving just a little deeper. I'm thinking it's too safe that they're just, okay, look, in your vision, you have two sets of voting, right? You have your jury and your televote. It's too safe that it, they're just appealing to just one and not both. So look at Caesar. He won the jury vote. Nathan, he didn't get any televotes from the public. Zoe, she ranked higher in the televote than she did with the jury. And with Austria, they didn't get anything in the televote and they got something in the jury, but obviously that didn't count. So I think it's too safe to the fact that it's not risky enough that it's there's no equilibrium is my main issue, just because of the fact that there's no balance. As with Lewis said, the quality is there. It's maybe just finding the right ingredients overall to just say okay this is a song that can appeal to juries and televoters so I I think it's just fine it's going to be a trial and error here I think because I I'd love them to see go back to a national final for them to try and find that because I mean look you had Zoe and you had to make mix who got something from the the jury but on television but still it's something but if they if they do you know, stick with the internal and like finding a way to it. I just think it's just looking back and hopefully they can find they can find the spark again. Just because it worked out very it it the quality is there. It's just there's something missing. That's all I can say about it. Yeah, I think my one word to kind of describe what Austria has has done in the past decade and also kind of a bit overall. Um, looking at all their entries is inconsistent, Um, not maybe necessarily in terms of the results, but in terms of kind of the style, because we went from something like Conchita to The Make Makes to Zoe to Nathan Trent, and all four of those are very different kind of styles of, of music and somehow all appeal to me. But I can see that like, you know, they have tended to lean a bit more towards jury appeal. And I will say that they've also tried out quite a few genres in terms of um, this, again, yeah, the style of music they sent, even before like this decade, because when I was looking through their past entries, um, I would kind of say like Cesar Sampson's Nobody But You was kind of the tipping point for gospel becoming a very big presence in the contest because the year after you had John Lundvik from Sweden doing very well and then of course the introduction of the backing vocals allowed for a lot more gospel tinged entries in 2021 but they've actually been sending some gospel tinged entries all the way back in like the 90s I think 95 and 96 have some of that as well as well as 2000 but they've also sent really fun entries like in 2003 they've sent some very serious entries and it's, I can't think of any particular period where they've sent the same thing um, a few times in a row. They've always kind of sent something different. And I think, at, as you say, uh, Rosie and Lewis, it um, can be, you know, cutting edge for the time, but also has the effect of maybe not aging as well. Or it could be the other way around where it's not necessarily appreciated in its time, like, you know, the make fakes or Nathan Trent, but people saying now that it's quite good. 
I think Conchita was kind of lightning in a bottle, very good lightning in a bottle. But I feel like Austria, though they've been sending good entries, has kind of failed to recapture that, which is a shame because I feel like they're a country that has kind of shown that they really do care about being at the contest and they put on a very, very good one. But yeah, I would like to see them do well again. I mean, even Caesar Sampson placing first in the jury in, in, in 2018, I don't think anybody was expecting that. I think he himself was quite surprised when he won the jury. Um, and then, of course, they started announcing the televote and immediately he got his. And um, it was kind of like, well, I guess he's not winning that. But third is still a very respectable um, result, if not something that we expected going in but I feel like with every contest there's always kind of a surprise in terms of a result so we mentioned it briefly um but what are your thoughts about the current selection process and um if they went back to a national final what would you like to see from that okay for me um I actually started looking at Austria in 2013 which was one of the last times they've done a national selection. I like the method that they used on that just because of the fact that I think at this point, they, after the disaster from 2012, I'd say, they just said, okay, we need to find ways to improve. So when Osirai Group Din Sung contest actually came in, there was like, um, I think there was a mixture of juries. So it's like everyone was like, had a say on it. So it's like, not just, okay, not just professional singers, it's more of like, there is a whole range of people like judging the entries as it is. And I really like that concept where you're not just relying on one set of international. I think there was like the fans were involved as well. So if they do come back on a national final, national final, I hope that everyone's voices are heard. So it's just like, okay, one person might say it's good, but then you also have to look at the fans who, dearly in love the contest and knows what they're talking about because it's their bread and butter uh and obviously having the austrians say on their who their representative is going to be is another one so it's kind of like the fact that you know let's say if if the non-qualification or the qualification and the result that comes with it it's sort of like it's like a domino effect where you like the responsibility is joint so it's not like, uh, it, it, uh, some people might say like, um, you know what? I don't think we made the right decision, but I'm like, you can also say, well, you know, if the public chose them, so that's on them. And if the jury chose them, it's on them. So it's like, the blame is just not one-sided because it's just the way the voting happened. But if that's the case, I really hope that they do bring in submissions from like everyone and not just, establish artists if they do come back. Yeah, I'm on a fairly similar sort of level to Tim on this one. I feel like the problem that Austria has is standing out. So I feel like if you've already been through having to stand out from a selection of maybe six, eight songs, whatever, to be chosen, then I feel like that probably sets you in a pretty good stead to be then having to stand out within a, a semi-final. I feel like the internal selections have been really good at choosing very diverse, talented artists. I just think we don't then get to see what that song is going to look like when you put it in a selection of other songs. And so I feel like having that internal selection of the artists and the songs to take part in the national final I think would be great having the same group of people doing that because they choose really good people all of the time. But I then think having the public be able to say, this is what stands out to me in this selection would be a really good way of testing how it might stand out within an actual contest. That would be pretty similar. I think I do like the internal selection for uh, for Austria. I think it has it has produced some some great songs over the past over the past few years. I mean, Rise Like a Phoenix was internal selection. Foki Mit Dan Popo was national final. I mean, <laughs> yeah. what what more do you need to say? <laughs> but 
I do, but I do think the point that the point that's been made that it is hard to see to to see how they'll translate to the actual contest is a really good one. And I think even if it's not a style, a, a style that's worked for the UK, I think I've got uh, I've got to echo Rosie and Tim and say that a national final with artists and songs selected by the internal selection committee, a very pared down. Um, five six seven songs and artists i think that would be that that would be a great model for them uh but i i do want to say that uh i do think if 20 if 2020 had gone ahead alive would have do, would have put up a really good showing and i think that does show that inter the internal selections obviously i can't I, I can't guarantee it but i do think internal selections do produce uh interesting uh, interesting songs. I, I don't think it's just the more the more safe options because I think Alive is the most recent counterpoint to all that. I think one of my issues with the way they've done their internal selections um, in the past few years, at least, is that they announced the artist quite early, um, around November, December. I think um, at least from twenty eighteen onwards. And then the song itself kind of hasn't been released until kind of end of February, early March, um, which is when the onslaught of everything else is getting um, put out. And I think it could get a bit lost in the shuffle. That's not to say that things couldn't have maybe changed by the time of the contest, but I think like having those announcements so far apart, it's like, yay, we have an artist and then we kind of forget about it until the song itself comes out. Um, that being said, I do agree that Alive probably would have done very, very well in 2020, just given the field that it was in. Um, like It would have at least made the final for sure. But I also think that I'm a pre I do appreciate that instead of just trying to repeat the same thing that he did in 2020, that Vincent kind of switched it up and showed his range a bit with the song. I just think it was a little bit unfortunate that in that particular field, <laughs> um, it had a little bit of trouble standing out, especially since there was another song called Amen, um, which also had some trouble standing out. Well, you know, note to self, don't do, don't call your song Amen if you want to do well. Um, <laughs> but I don't know if I would completely abandon the internal selection just yet and go completely national final. I think if, because as you say, it's not really a very long streak yet. It's two non-qualifications. But if we were to go back to a national final, I think Austria values um, an artist with uh, kind of a point of view of what they want to do. Um, so even though, you know, Nathan Trent and Cesar Sampson and Panda, I could really tell that they were songs that really fit them. So I think maybe what they could do is maybe pick the artist internally and have a selection of songs to sing. Um, so that we could show a bit of range. So, but yeah, I don't know if I would abandon the internal selections uh, just yet because we haven't gotten to the point where it's like a, a three or four or five year long uh, non-qualification streak. All right. So we've talked about it a little bit um, in talking about getting back to the final, but what do you guys think it would take for Austria to get another win and on top of that is there anybody that you would like to see represent Austria in the future? I'm going to start on this one because I think there is an artist who has been absolutely robbed in another national selection who I would very much like to see come to ESC and that is Sara de Blue who was absolutely robbed at one in 360 and absolutely should have gone to Eurovision that year and would have given San Marino their best result ever but no they had to instead be dissing her on Twitter and she gave up and she was a quitter. So now she's going to show them that she is better and she's going to go and give Austria a great result. Yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> I... <laughs> I can't follow that up. I... <laughs> I'm not sure if there's any particular artist um, I'd, want, I, I'd want to see for Austria, I think. But I, I think part of what I like about them is just see is just seeing who they are, 
who they bring each year, just somebody new, uh, somebody different, but somebody incredibly talented. And I'm not sure go, uh, going back to any, uh, to any of the older artists would really work, but I, I, I think to, to continue getting a win, uh, to get another win, you need the power that, that Conchita brought, I think. I think the quality has been consistent since, uh, since 2014, but all that's missing is just that spark, that, that power, that performance, that story. And I think if they, can, if they can put forward an artist and a song that embodies that, that is going to be another win, hands down. Uh, I've already mentioned like briefly on national selections if they do come back with that. But looking at the artist, there's one. Um, she got really close. She got to the final stage and she actually participated in Beovizia 2020 instead with it. Uh, her name is Thea, Day Thea Davy. Uh, hopefully I pronounced that right. Um, I'm actually curious with how she would have done. I mean, yay for picking Vincent just because it's me. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I would be curious if what would happen if she gets there in the end. So if, I think I wouldn't be surprised if Austria just picks her because she was so close in 2020. Other than that, if if someone can make a comeback, uh, I end up with a better song that can hopefully appeal to both sides because she was involved. Yeah, I'd have to say part of why I look forward to Austria each year is they tend to pick someone who is new enough to the industry where they're not like a big name yet, but also someone with a bit of performing experience. I think one of the things that came out when like Cesar Sampson was announced that he was like a yoga instructor in his day job, but still had just an incredible presence um, on the stage. So I do like seeing um, who they're going to pick each year. And I would have to say, I think if anybody should come back, I know everybody's like, you know, Conchita, Conchita, we want her back. We love her, but like we can have her in the interval acts, them in the interval acts, I should say. But I, I do think that make makes were robbed and maybe part of it is because of the burning piano. Like, come on, they did that for you when you didn't give them points, how rude. But I do quite like their style of music and maybe something a little bit more up-tempo from, from them. But I thought they were quite charismatic on stage. They had their own unique look. Yeah. And then also, of course, Panda. I would like, I want her back. <laughs> she was so good. Did you see the video that Make Makes made after they uh, got their results? They made a video that goes, we are the zeros of our times. And they had torches and they were just waving them around on the background. You're not the only and one, it's incredible. actually. incredible. <laughs> not the only one, actually. I think Anne Sophia also did that because she also got Neil Poir with her both backing Rob. singers. Yeah, both, both yeah. Rob. I do appreciate that they had a good sense of humor about it. Um, I think some other countries could maybe learn from that a little bit. <clears throat> cough, cough, UK, cough, cough. Um, okay, cool although, <laughs> although James, uh, you know, he, he seemed to take it in stride, but the press did not. But yeah, I think, you know, I think it's safe to say that, you know, we, you know, appreciate what Austria is doing. I think part of the excitement with Austria is um, you never quite know what you're going to get, but you know, that's going to be something more or less of good, of good quality, even if it's something that maybe won't do well on the night. Um, as I say, like I have you know, the Eurovision albums from like 2017 onwards and like Austria's entries are, are they're never skips for me. I'll always listen to them. Um, but anyways, do we have any final thoughts on Austria going forward before we wrap up? I'm just slightly reminded of Forrest Gump now and just imagining, imagining him sitting on a bench being like, life is like an Austrian Eurovision entry. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> I've not actually seen the film. Don't judge my voice. I just know the quote. <laughs> also, somewhere out there, Rory is asking Nathan Trent to step on him. I mean. <laughs> Anyways, I mean, what a, what a joyful performer. Just a wonderful presence at the contest. And also, yes. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, if that is all for this week, We'll go ahead and wrap this up. 
That brings us to the end of this edition of that Eurovision podcast. Thank you so much, Tim, Rosie and Lewis for joining me today and talking about Austria. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at that Euro site. And you can listen to our podcast, that Eurovision podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Make sure to visit our website, thateurovisionsite.com, for all of the latest Eurovision news and check out our calendar for upcoming Eurovision events. There's lots of junior Eurovision going on at the moment. Um, with all that said, thank you all very much for listening and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.